So a few weeks ago, this was trending on Twitter. I should have made a video about it then, but for some reason I didn't. I sort of just forgot. But no worries, I remember now and better late than never. So recently, there was a public declaration that was released signed by over a thousand scientists stating that there is no climate emergency. The reason this misinformation is so dangerous is because it attempts to disguise itself as if it's the real position of scientists, or at the very least, make it seem to the public that the matter is not settled in the science, both of which are not true whatsoever. Moreover, the declaration is easy to read, uses simple terminology, and is very subjective. All of these combined together, read by an unaware individual who otherwise hasn't yet dived deep into the topic, can be very convincing. But I suppose this is where my job comes in. Let's take a brief look at the actual declaration itself. First of all, the entire statement is one page long. Yep, the whole thing has 38 pages, but two of them are dedicated to the title, one for an inspirational quote, and 34 of them listing out the supposed scientists who have signed this declaration. Okay, so let's read through what this says. I'm going to debunk each of these sections very briefly without going into too much detail. There is no climate emergency. Climate science should be less political, while climate policies should be more scientific. Scientists should openly address uncertainty certainties and exaggerations in their predictions of global warming, while politicians should dispassionately count the real costs as well as the imagined benefits of their policy measures. Now I agree mostly with this first part of the statement, we should try to strive away from politics when making decisions regarding combating climate change. But of course I also understand that inevitably we're going to need to involve politics since many of these solutions will involve political measures and laws, but we have definitely gone too far in that end where even the existence of climate change is a political topic. The science itself should never be political. Science is science and knowledge should strictly remain in the realms of science. Now moving on to the next part of this statement, yes of course scientists should openly address uncertainties and exaggerations in their predictions of global warming, but this document makes it sound like that isn't a common practice or hasn't been done, when in reality it has. Scientists, no matter the topic, will talk about shortcomings of their models and what that means, usually involving a call to action for further research, and climate science is no exception. Given that, we have made reasonable predictions for the future of Earth's climate even after acknowledging those shortcomings. So in short, we have and are already doing that. And then finally, regarding the last sentence, it's very difficult for people to see the cost versus benefits of something that would affect us in the future, or for future generations. But the reality is, the cost of cleaning up climate change right now will be absolutely minuscule compared to the costs we will have to pay later on to deal with the aftermaths of climate change. Things like droughts, rising sea levels, natural disasters, etc. Natural as well as anthropogenic factors cause warming. The geological archive reveals that Earth's climate has varied as long as the planet has existed with natural cold and warm phases. The Little Ice Age ended as recently as 1850. Therefore, it is no surprise that we are now experiencing a period of warming. Just by reading this statement, you can tell that this wasn't written by a natural climate scientist. Because the Earth going through natural cycles of cooling and warming is a well-known phenomenon that is taken into consideration in pretty much all climate models. You think scientists who have dedicated their lives to studying the Earth's climate don't know that the Earth can change temperatures by itself? There are many reasons that warming can happen, and the Earth is quite prone to positive feedback loops where any trigger of warming or cooling can set it off to even more warming or cooling. The question here is now, what is triggering this warming we are currently seeing today. And scientists have shown that without a shadow of a doubt that it is caused by human activity and greenhouse gas emissions. But of course, this is also different than any type of warming in Earth's history, for example, such as the speed of warming. I've explained this a few times in previous videos, so check them out if you haven't already. Warming is far slower than predicted. The world has warmed significantly less than predicted by IPCC on the basis of modeled anthropogenic forcing. The gap between the real world and the modeled world tells us that we are far from understanding climate change. This claim is empty due to the lack of detail. It fails to acknowledge that the IPCC didn't make exact predictions, but rather multiple depending on action outcome, and in addition that they are ranges and not exact temperature predictions. Now, the Earth has warmed on average 0.8 degrees Celsius, give or take per decade, since 1980 according to NOAA's annual climate report, with greater increases in the latter years, which makes sense, the IPCC has predicted a few scenarios such as 0.1 degrees per decade, just above 0.1 degrees per decade, or 0.2 degrees per decade depending on measures taken. The range ends up being anywhere between 0.1 to 0.35 degrees per decade, the higher end being business as usual, and this is what we saw over the past decade. So the predictions were indeed accurate. But of course, they also had a wide range, because it depended a lot on our countermeasures to greenhouse gas emissions. The IPCC definitely acknowledges here that human activity is responsible to the Earth's recent warming since the model depended so heavily on human action in the future. The claim that the IPCC exaggerated warming actually comes from a lot of cherry picking where we had various natural events change the course of temperature increase, temporarily. Taking out a small chunk in the grand scheme of temperature rises over the last few decades is unproductive and doesn't disprove anything. Anyway, moving on. 
Climate policy relies on inadequate models. Climate models have many shortcomings that are not remotely plausible as policy tools. They do not only exaggerate the effects of greenhouse gases, they also ignore the fact that enriching the atmosphere with CO2 is beneficial. Okay, this is another incredibly vague claim. What shortcomings and what policy tools are you talking about? The only thing climate scientists try to give us are the facts. How we use those facts is up to the rest of us. Also, enriching the atmosphere with CO2 is only beneficial up to a certain point, and we're well beyond that at this point. More on that in the next section. CO2 is not a pollutant. It is essential to all life on Earth. More CO2 is favorable for nature, greening our planet. Additional CO2 in the air has promoted growth in global plant biomass. It is also profitable for agriculture, increasing the yields of crops worldwide. This is also another piece of evidence that this is clearly not written by a scientist. Yes, CO2 is essential to all life on Earth, but everything needs moderation and CO2 is no exception. You can't just dump as much CO2 in the atmosphere as possible and expect things to only get better. It's good to drink water, but there is such thing as too much water, which can can kill you. Yes, plants in general do like CO2 since it is a food source for them and allows them to grow. However, your fantasy world would only be true if CO2 was the only thing that increased. The reality is CO2 comes with various side effects to the earth including temperature increases and shifting of rainwater causing droughts in various regions. Both of these end up suppressing the amount of photosynthesis and biome production. So while CO2 by itself is beneficial, high temperatures and droughts are not. What we end up seeing is that in general the biome of the earth will originally start increasing in photosynthetic activities, but that begins to plateau off as we put more CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's because under high temperatures, water transpires from the leaves at a greater rate. This combined with lower amounts of water, or in some places more water but less nitrogen and nutrients in the soil due to runaway, it's important to preserve resources. And since the method of gas transmission in leaves is the same for CO2 and H2O, plants will choose to close their stomata for longer periods of time, reducing photosynthetic activities. So the reality is no, increasing CO2 won't just magically flourish our plant life. It would be able to do that if we only increase CO2 and other factors remain constant. We actually have a scenario like this already, and it's called a greenhouse, where everything is very heavy controlled including the water and temperature. Unfortunately, the earth in general is not a controlled greenhouse and we can't control all external factors for all plant life on earth. So no, your argument here is a bad one and has been debunked already. Global warming has not increased natural disasters. There's no statistical evidence that global warming is intensifying hurricanes, floods, droughts, and such like natural disasters or making them more frequent. However, there is ample evidence that CO2 mitigation measures are as damaging as they are costly. Actually, there is evidence for global warming increasing the frequency and intensity of various natural disasters. Many studies have already looked into this. I'll try to link a few of those in the description for those of you who are interested. But in short, increases in temperatures result in many downstream consequences, including but not limited to decreased snowfall, drying soils, increased forest fires, more frequent flooding, and increased hurricane frequency. That's all I'm going to say on this topic since there is not much else to mention. Climate policy must respect scientific and economic realities. There is no climate emergency. Therefore, there is no cause for panic and alarm. We strongly oppose the harmful and unrealistic net zero CO2 policy proposed for 2050. Go for adaptation instead of mitigation. Adaptation works whatever the causes are. Okay, first of all, whether or not there is a climate emergency depends on how you define emergency. I personally wouldn't necessarily call it an emergency, but rather something we need to heavily consider and take action as soon as possible. It's not an emergency in the sense that if we don't do something today, we're all going to die tomorrow. Tomorrow. And regarding the second sentence, yes, of course, there is no cause for panic and alarm. Stop trying to paint us as saying we need to panic. Instead, be wary, take action, and use your voting power. Finally, this is something I've heard some people say that we should adapt instead of mitigate. Personally, I think this is a bad approach because one, the cost to adaptation is going to be significantly higher than the cost of mitigation. And two, adapting later means we would already suffer the consequences. For example, food shortages, heat strokes, destruction of infrastructure. These are all consequences that we would have to face before we fully adapt adapt, and that's not even considering so many things that a disruption of ecosystems would cause. The science is clear, and what we should do is also clear. We need to take action as soon as we can, and mitigate as much as we can. Of course, no one is saying to disrupt all functions of the economy to achieve this goal, but we have to start acknowledging that climate change is a real threat and we need to address it as one. Okay, so now that we went through the one relevant page of this declaration, I'm going to give my overall thoughts to this. Obviously, this is one of the most dishonest piece of publications I've ever seen. It is clear that this was not written by actual scientists from the wording itself. Not only is it riddled with biases, it also includes simple terminology and wording that would otherwise not be used in actual papers in scientific publications. Let me just give one example. The wording here says, the gap between the real world and the modeled world tells us that we are far from understanding climate change. 
you would almost never see blah 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 tells us blah 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 in scientific papers or statements. The wording is usually along the lines of blah blah concludes or blah blah indicates that blah blah blah. You never use subjective or personal wording such as tells us something is true or false. And this page is riddled with that type of wording or sentence structure which immediately tells me that someone who isn't involved in science wrote this paper. Finally, the vast majority of the people who signed off on this declaration either have no work in climate science at all or have ties to big oil companies. They're their names on the declaration looks very authentic, disguised behind those awesome sounding titles. That's why I think this is incredibly disgusting, because it doesn't even attempt to play fair in an honest debate, but rather would use trickery in an attempt to deceive people into being a climate skeptic. Okay, that's the end of my rant. Thank you to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Miss Fixit, and Edward Martin, whose support is keeping this channel alive. I'll see you in the next one, as usual.